We are in our fifth week of the sermon series on our way to Jerusalem. And we've been looking at the interactions that Jesus has been having on the way to the cross. And today, uh, the sermon is Jesus and Lazarus. And we will hear that story, that very long story in a minute. We will not have to stand for the gospel. We usually do, but this one's like 45 verses. Um, And I was going to do this sermon like I've done the rest of them, just primarily focused on this text in particular. But I was reading a book this week, and I I just couldn't shake what I was reading. Uh, It was speaking so deeply into the scripture for me. And it's... um, the work of a young theologian named Amy Barber, who's working on her PhD at Garrett. And uh, I put a very, two very difficult sentences <laughs> into your bulletins today as kind of my inspiration for this piece. And I encourage you to take this home and just digest it, because it is very um, thick. And so I just want to read this before we start. Christian justice and love cannot be imagined apart from the exhumation and reparation of hurt bodies and hurt memories. The Christian Bible itself is a vehicle carrying forward the story of a traumatized community's responsibility to transfigure a hurt body and to transform the shame and horror of hurt memories into a proclamation of good news. That's what this sermon is about today. You can take this home and read it like six times like I had to. Just put it in your pocket (laughs) as you you digest that. Go ahead. Hear these words. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was merely re- referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, 
will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, Already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We usually do a lot of Bible um, in this service and in my preaching, and today we're going to do more theology. Theology means what we think about God, and in this case, the triune God, because we'll have the actions of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But let's do a short recap, because that's a long story and can be kind of hard to keep up with, right? Okay. So our story is about Jesus' super close friends. They're his super close friends, and they're also disciples. And the first people named are Mary and Martha, and then Lazarus. Sometimes uh, people think that Lazarus might be the beloved disciple in the book of John, but that's an, old, that's an old debate. We know that Jesus was really close with his family. We know that they were friends. And uh, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick and dying, and that Jesus needs to get there right now, right now, if he wants to heal Lazarus or even to say his goodbyes. And instead of responding immediately, Jesus waits two days. Which, um, at this point of the story, <laughs> would make me wonder both about the goodness of God and of Jesus. About why would Jesus let something like that happen. So Lazarus dies and is buried, so to speak. His body is put in the tomb where his flesh would remain as the memory of his loss is now running its mixed bag of pain, suffering, and anger throughout the family and the community that loved him. Jewish people do not mourn alone, so the community is with the sisters mourning. And this pain is running through them like blood through their bodies. We feel the pain of Martha and Mary as they each individually say, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And we notice that the scriptures give both of them time to say this and to name their pain and to name their anguish. The naming of 
our pain and our anguish is really important for people who suffer, to be given the space to do that. And this is also a biblical tradition. It reminds me of the times in the Old Testament, primarily in the Psalms and the Lamentations, but other places as well, where someone has screamed out to God from the depths of their soul and from their memories and their bones. Oh God, where are you? Lord of all, I need you and I need you now. Where are you, God? If you would have been here, my loved one would still be alive. A quote from our psalm from the lectionary today is an example of this. It starts out with, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. This psalm, like many psalms, acknowledge that God is someone that we can and should holler out to in times of our suffering. And indeed, we need to let that out. And Jesus makes space. He makes space for the cries of Martha and of Mary. And Lazarus is resurrected from the dead and returned and restored to the community who witnessed the occasion. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, we're getting a glimpse of a few different things here. But really, at the heart of this, is we're getting a glimpse at what the resurrection of Jesus is going to be all about. In the resuscitation of Lazarus, we may think that this, this sign took place only because this was Jesus' friend. I mean, we have this line about, uh, in other translations, how Jesus wept, right? That, that Jesus was so deeply moved because this was one of his friends, and, and this may make us assume that the, the resurrection of Lazarus was only about the personal relationship that Jesus had with this family. And I'm sure some of that spoke into this. How could it not? Jesus was human. But the resurrection of Lazarus is meant to fit into a much larger story. The story of Jesus and the much larger story of the Bible and of human history itself. See, when we talk about how Jesus saves, this is something Christians like to talk about, right? How Jesus saves and Jesus' ability to save. When we talk about this, we often turn to the resurrection, right? And, and we may think um, about that personal need that we have to be saved, to be restored to the community, right, or to God. Maybe that we've been in so much pain and suffering that we understand that if Jesus was able to be resurrected, that, that anything in our lives could, could be restored and redeemed, yeah. And we may even go as far to, to imagine the day that all bodies will experience a physical resurrection, that the loved ones that we have lost, that we will be able to walk with them again and talk with them again. And all of that is true. All of that is true about the resurrection. But it's actually not just about that. And it's not just about us. Just as it was not just about Lazarus. The story of the Bible, the entire Bible, is the story of God's people struggling to be God's people against the realities of their lives. They have suffered as a community. They are always trying to become or to be better at the community that God envisioned for them, but that seems to always fail. Someone always seems to end up in the place of being oppressed, like the Hebrew people in Israel when they were enslaved in Egypt or under Babylon, right? Or, or if they're not under the thumb of being oppressed, then they find themselves in the role of the oppressor. The Pharaoh, King David, right? And, and, and there's always this unfairness about it all. God's will is to save the community the community that we've heard about since the beginning of these stories. Seeing, seeing this story of, of Lazarus and of Jesus as just one story within the history of the Bible changes our perspective on this. And it points to, to the idea of God not letting go quite yet and God continuing to find a new way to restore us. It points to a time and a will that God has for the community where we will be healed in our memories and we will be healed in our bodies, where the forces of oppression will no longer harm. 
Think of all the stories of God's people and the least of these experiencing great oppression and suffering. Think about the generations and generations of that suffering compiling. I mean, we hear about it. We hear about it over and over again in the scriptures. We hear about it at the Magnificat. We hear those voices, right? Even the scriptures that Jesus knew and grew up with, which would have been what we call the Old Testament, we hear the voice of generations and generations in Jesus, God enters history, this history that was recorded in the Bible. And when God enters history, it's not just to be here among the people as a person, but it is to bring about a way to save these hurt bodies and these hurt memories of times past, the generational memories that haunt us as a people as we are trying to figure out what it means to be community. God, through Jesus Christ, enters history and enters the story of the Bible to say, redemption and restoration is God's goal. And through the actions of the Holy Spirit, God will bring God's love and justice to repair and redeem not only the flesh, but our story, our shared memories. And that, that we too, as Christians are called to be a part of this. We're called to be a part of this work. It's about saving the community. This is what it means to be Christians. That in our time, in our short moment in history, we too are to be working towards healing these broken and bruised memories of community. Being inspired by the Holy Spirit to do the work in spaces of brokenness of relationship and to listen and to learn and to heal one another as the Spirit moves between us all. Jesus shows us that we are here to listen to the hurting, those who have suffered, and to speak life back into those spaces by our actions and our care, just as Jesus spoke life back into the flesh of Lazarus. I'm going to quote another piece of lectionary today. I'm not using all four, only three. This one's from our Old Testament. It's from the prophet Ezekiel. This is amazing. Ezekiel has a vision, all right? The hand of the Lord came upon me. He brought me up by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many laying in the valley, and they were very dry. And he said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay snooze on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and there were snooze on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your soil, and then you shall know that I the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. 
Oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. This is our story. This is our story. It's the story of a God who wants to free the oppressed and save the world, to breathe life back into where there is no life, to mend the brokenness between us all. And that the healing of Lazarus, it is clear that, that that spirit, that the work of the spirit is, it, is happening. It allows Lazarus to live again. It can allow us to live again. We can begin to envision or to witness a full resurrection of bodies that may have been harmed by war or by others, by systems of oppressions, by our faults and our addictions, by our fears and our angers. When the Spirit is doing her work, healing happens. And Ezekiel pointed to it, but in the healing of Lazarus, and Jesus is still remaining there, we know it to be true. When we think about salvation, we think about the healing of Lazarus as a precursor, kind of letting us know this is going to happen. This story witnesses to the much larger picture of God's salvific work in history. In this act, Jesus was pointing to a larger act of salvation, one that would save the entire community and the entire world. And this is the hope that Jesus gives us right here in this story about Lazarus and his sisters. And this story explains one other thing. It explains why Jesus will die. The verses immediately following this, the last verse we heard was, and some people believed because of it. The next verses say this, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called the meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. It is because of the healing of Lazarus and that power of the triune God that comes through that the threat is so real to the authorities of this world. This kind of hope, right? this kind of justice and love that God is offering, this redemption, this restoration, it is so radical that the authorities of this world will shake and tremble at the greatness of the triune God. This healing that is offered through the resurrection and redemption of bodies and of corporate memory is so threatening to those with power in this world that they will hang an innocent man on the cross for it. Over and over again throughout history. There are communities that have suffered immensely at the hands of ruling powers of this world. Every generation. Not just the communities listed in the biblical narrative, but others as well. This idea that the Holy Spirit, Jesus and God, can bring about the work of redeeming not only bodies, but also the memory and history of a people harmed and shamed is by far, most, by far the most intriguing and compelling of Christian truths for me. It is no wonder that certain church folk kind of tie this together better than maybe the churches I was raised in. Other traditions tend to look back at the other stories of the Old Testament better than we do, kind of witnessing to the fact that this redemption offered by Jesus was the same redemption that God has supplied and will continue to supply. They put their hope not only in Christ but in other stories as well. My main uh, example of this is when I did a cross-cultural at an African-American black Baptist church in northern Chicago, and I had to ask the person who was sponsoring me and walking me through that why they kept mentioning the Exodus and Moses in ev almost every single sermon. Why every time? And why is it when they were singing a song about Jesus, do they keep talking about Moses? Why is it every time they're singing about Jesus saving the world, they're always talking about the Exodus? And I was taught about the corporate memory and suffering of a community under slavery 
and how when they first heard these texts, how they understood as the way that God saved the people in Israel so they would be saved again through Jesus Christ in this world and in the next, that they would experience the full redemption of their bodies. And so how could you not mention Moses? For our time of reflection today, our song of reflection, Kirsten will be singing an old African-American spiritual called Oh Mary, Don't You Weep. And the lyrics go like this. Oh Mary, don't you weep, don't you mourn. They're talking about Mary of our story here. But it goes, Oh Mary, don't you weep, don't you mourn. Pharaoh's army got drowned. So oh Mary, don't you weep. See, <laughs> Jesus is our personal savior. Yes. Yes, church, we get that, okay? But that is actually not what killed him. It is the threat of the salvific power of the triune God that got him killed. It is the people who say, as Jesus said, inspired by the Spirit, no, you will not harm my neighbor because God has a plan that I am part of. It is the threat that says to the powers that be, I value my neighbor and I believe in the restoration of community and I will put my life down for that. Jesus can be our personal savior, yes. But let us not forget our neighbors and those whose memories have been haunted by history, those whose bodies have been marked by death because of wars and purposeful division by the powers that be. So, all I have for the end here is some questions for us and no answers. So if God is working to save communities, generations of bodies and memories that we find in the narrative of the Bible, that begs the question, who is the community that God is saving? Who is included in that for you? And who is not included? And who do you think the Holy Spirit is including? And then... What does it look like for God to save the community and for the Holy Spirit to do this work among us? And then, what part of this work are you called to do? And what would that witness look like? Amen.